everything in this video I'm going to be talking about is coming from my personal experience. So I just hope to be as unbiased as possible. But this is going to be my experience with AA and with TSM, aka naltrexone, drinking and naltrexone. So first things first is a little bit about me. Um, I would consider myself a real alcoholic. Um, I started drinking at age 14, just to give you a brief overview. Um, immediately, it changed my life. I felt like I could not breathe. I could not do anything right in life. Um, my body was always tense. I didn't know how to use my words. I had so much social anxi uh, anxiety that um, just being in high school and around people was just torture for me. And as soon as I found drinking, I felt like I could speak to people, I could relax, I could breathe, I could... My whole world changed. Everybody all the best way I've heard it explained is this: you walk into a party, everybody's mean, staring at you, you don't know what to say, you just want to hide in a corner, you want to run. What alcohol did for me, it changed that room into all these friendly people who wanted to get to know you, who were smiling at you, um, who were inviting, welcome welcoming and that's the world alcohol gave me so leading into that all the way up until i was 35 my last drink was the conor mcgregor fight i believe it was in july um all the way up what well, i think 36 37 so but i would consider myself sober for about a year now a year and a half um even though i did drink that one time I did not enjoy it. I threw up immediately. I had one beer, mixed it with naltrexon and uh, kratom, and I threw up and got real sick. It, I just, whatever. But I drank for these this amount of years. What is that, 20 years? 20 plus years. So I was a binge drinker. I would start drinking, not be able to stop. Uh, and when at, it, at its worst, it was going on for like four days at a time and then I'd get sober for like two three days and be horribly hung over and then try to white knuckle it and this is just process just kept going on and on and on uh almost ruined my marriage uh my wife was about at the point she told me she had to leave and I broke down and um you know told myself I have to find a solution you know AA is not working therapy is not working I tried everything um they say AA is the last, last house on the block. Uh, it was literally the last house on the block for me. I, I gave my everything. Um, I went through all 11 steps. Uh, I would consider myself going through all the 12 steps. Uh, I didn't actually sponsor anybody, but I was volunteering. I did do panels. Um, I consider myself, I gave 100% what I had to, to give. I was desperate. Uh, Therapy didn't work. Um, so I found Claudia Christian's YouTube video. I found her documentary, One Little Pill. Started on Naltrexone. Immediately I knew this was going to work. Um, it took about a year to get to full extinction. And now I'm completely sober. So I just want to get into um, the positive and negatives in my experience. What the differences are in AA. What I have found. I was in AA. My first meeting was around 20. My last meeting was around uh, 35, 36. So I was in AA, in and out for about 15, uh, 16 years. I'd say in total, with uh, the years countered out, probably about nine to 10 years consistently. Um, so I have a lot of experience with AA. I have a lot of experience with sponsors. I have a lot of experience with rehabs, going to rehabs and just knowing what these treatment centers and what AA is about. I've been to tons and tons of meetings in different states, different types, open meetings, closed meetings, men's meetings, uh, pri like little meetings with like four people, huge meetings where there's speakers. So I just want to give my experience on what AA did for me, what's positive about AA, what's negative about AA, what's positive about uh, the Sinclair method and naltrexone and what's negative about the Sinclair method and naltrexone. And I really, really hope this adds value to you if you're uh, struggling with alcohol, if you're a parent or a loved
loved one of an alcoholic and you're looking for some clarifications i i hope that this video gives that to you so i just want to get started i don't want to waste your time i've written down notes um on aa so i'm going to just get started the positive in aa the 12 steps are i believe divinely perfect now what do i mean by that i i believe that the 12 step steps are a program of steps that people can follow uh, if they follow them correctly through the big book of AA the blue book that they give you I believe that it can be a hundred percent life transforming and spiritual way to live and change your life for the better 100% I love the steps I believe in them a hundred percent I do believe that they're perfectly made for people who don't know how to live have no idea of what the hell they're doing, uh, have no idea about spirituality, or even just how to live right, just no sense on what to do. Like, what do I do? Where do I start? 12 steps are amazing. Um, number two, uh, a lot of experience in the meetings. There's a lot of people that have been there for decades. They know what they're talking about. They can give you wisdom. They can explain to you what they have learned. You can learn a lot from these people. Um, meetings give you a, sp a spiritual filling. Like they, they fill you up. If you're feeling like shit, um, a lot of these meetings you can go in. The attitude, the energy, most of the time can fill you up. There's some bad meetings with bad energy. Some very sick people in AA. And I've been to some very crappy meetings where they argue. There's been uh, physical fights. Uh, that I've seen the just nasty nasty stuff that's come out of them. That's very rare, but I've been to them um, There's a lot of support in meetings. There's a lot of people that are there uh, They will support you their whole mission in life if they've been through the steps if they haven't been through the steps, but are taught to Support others. Uh, there's a lot of support. There's a lot of people that will listen. There's a lot of people that will uh, Be healthy in AA to be around um, going off that, there's a lot, of, a lot of friends you can make in AA. They tell you to stop drinking, stop being around your old crowd, get a new group of friends. And in this, you can find positive friends, positive people to hang out with, do sober things with. So you can make new friends. You can make a new social group. It's very positive in that light. Meetings are everywhere. Meaning if you travel, if you move. Um, there's usually a meeting within a few miles anywhere you travel in the U.S. I don't know about uh, like nationally or internationally or whatever, but meetings are everywhere. They shouldn't be hard to find 24 hours of the day, no matter what situation you're in. If you're homeless, if you're rich, you can go to a meeting. Um, AA can completely change your life around for... The better I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen people struggle. I've seen alcoholics from the the worst, you know, homelessness to getting jobs and and working the steps and completely. They say that, like the light comes back in their eyes. You can see their spirit change. Their whole being changes. This is possible. Um, I'm sure there's more positive things. Um, if you want to help me out, you can comment down below. Tell me some more of what you think from your experiences are. Um, in AA, I'm sure I've missed some, but that is all the positives that I have for AA written down. Now, going on the negative, um, this is my experience. Just remember that. Uh, as a newcomer, at my first meeting, I had zero idea. Everybody kept telling me what to go to meetings, go to meetings, go to meetings. If you're an alcoholic, you have an alcoholic problem, go to meetings. You need an alcoholic meetings. That's what they say. So I went to a meeting. Um, my friend had just passed away. Uh, it was very scary. So I was like, on that trip where I'm like, fuck, I got to get my life together. I need to change. So I went to a meeting. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I thought there was going to be like some drunk guy, like passed out in a corner, like miserable people, like uh, a smelly dude, you know, sitting by me, uh, you know, that may have like wet his pants or something like somebody drunk which I've actually seen, uh, but I thought there was th this vision of mine that I thought was going to be like alcoholics, but, you know, I thought there was going to be all this weird shit going on, and there were just regular people very happy to see me, and uh, they were sitting at a table, offered coffee, and 
I didn't know what to say. There's no rules. Nobody comes up and tells you like, hey, this is how you speak. This is what you listen for. This is, you talk from your experience. That's why I'm talking my experience um, to, to you because I learned that from AA. They teach you very, very valuable things. But to get to these things, you have to either be taught them and you have to be guided through them. And as a newcomer, you don't know what the hell to do. Nobody comes along, at least for me, the thousands of meetings I've been to, no one ever came up to me and said, hey, I'm going to be your guide. I'm going to do this. Uh, it was the treatment center that actually taught me that. The treatment center ran down everything you need to do in AA. You look for a sponsor, listen to the similarities, share from your experience, you know, uh, things like that, that really... I don't think I would have gotten if I didn't go to treatment. So that's another thing positive for a treatment center. I would have never known to look for a sponsor if I didn't uh, go to treatment. Um, so that's the newcomer thing. Um, most sponsors I had do not take you through the steps. Now, even knowing I need to work the steps, even though that's what they talk about. I would say over the 10, 15 years, I've had five or so sponsors. Uh, one, my first one was a really, really, really good one. He read the AA big book with me, page by page. We would go back and forth. This is how it's supposed to be done. Luckily, this was my first sponsor. Now I moved, um, I moved from California back to Georgia and I tried to get another one there and this sponsor was Buddhist. So all he did with me was meditate. This is literally all we did. And I was the one who had to ask him to go through the steps with me. And he like, didn't want to do it. And he like, was really weird about it. And, um, I remember my mom died during the time that, uh, he was my sponsor and he had me meditate. And I just knew that in my gut, there was something wrong. And I've seen this over and over again. My wife, uh, now my wife, she was my girlfriend at the time, went to Al-Anon. She asked for a sponsor because I told her, hey, you know, you need a sponsor to guide you. Her sponsor never fucking called her, never guided her on anything, didn't even reach out to her, which was, it pissed me off because not a not only did, is it hard for somebody to go uh, ask for a sponsor, but to not have them call you or guide you for anything is just, it just pisses me off. Because this is life and death we're talking about. This is extremely serious to me. As I'm sure it is with you, this is going to kill somebody if they don't stop drinking. So when I talk about this, I talk about this with passion because this almost cost me my fucking life. So it gets me emotional. Um, my point was, most sponsors that I've had over the five or six, if they did take me through the steps, it was very, very slow. And it was only two or three sponsors out of the six that I had. Half of them just wanted to be my sponsor. Just wanted to talk to me. Just wanted to fucking... They wanted me to come over and like wash their car and be of service. And this is before we even got to the steps. They're like, come wash my car. Come clean the, the leaves. Come help me paint. Come do this, do this, do this. And nowhere in the fucking big book do I hear that you need to come do work for somebody else. Uh, and not go through the steps. So that was learning, looking back on that, it just kind of fucked up to me. Uh, but I was supposed to follow everything that my sponsor did. No questions asked. You're just supposed to follow blindly. Uh, and I would argue that that is a hundred percent bullshit. If they take you through the steps as an outline in the big book, yes, that's a great sponsor, but there are very sick people in AA and some of them unfortunately can become your sponsor. So I would look out for that. Um, do not, AA does not allow you to talk about other methods that work. Um, Naltrexon, I think Vivitrol, I think is another one. It's a shot you can get. I, I think that's it. I don't know. That could be like a pregnancy medication or <laughs> anti-pregnancy medication. I don't know. There's another one that's a shot I know. But now tricks on the Sinclair method, you are not allowed to talk about that. You're not allowed to talk about um, religions. There's rules. 
Uh, obviously, it's an anonymous program. You're not allowed to talk about who's in there, but everybody does it anyways. But my point is you cannot talk about other things that are saving lives. Another negative about AA, it's sporting a 3% to 10% success rate from people who go in there, to treatment centers. How many people do you know have been to treatment that it does not work? Because I've been there, people go three, four, five times that run about out of insurance and they have to pay out of pocket and it doesn't fucking work and it costs them money, costs them stress, and they sell you false hope. Uh, maybe like... One out of like 20 people I know stayed sober, but I don't know if I can uh, give credit to treatment centers. You can go to AA for free. The treatment centers just teach you to go to AA. That's literally all they do. They do teach you things like listen to uh, similarities, go to meetings, get a sponsor, get a book. Uh, that's what I was taught. They make you go to meetings. They basically keep you dry from alcohol and drugs, but you could still get alcohol and drugs into treatment centers if you want it badly enough. I've seen it happen. People were doing drugs and pills at and drinking at the rehab centers. So to me, it's just not worth it. Um, the Sinclair method has a 78% success rate. This is on their website. Uh, I will put a uh, screenshot right here. But I 100% believe it because it worked for me. And I was in AA for 15 years. I gave my 100%. I did all the way up to 11 step. I would say 12. I just never sponsored anybody. But I gave my all. And I kept going back and I kept going back and I kept going back. And I kept getting crushed. I kept getting crushed. I was told after I drank again that I didn't want it bad enough. I'm not taking it seriously. My self-esteem just kept getting destroyed because I was a binge drinker. Uh, I just couldn't get it. Uh, I didn't want it bad enough, apparently. Um, and it's just devastating to hear as an alcoholic to be not welcome or made to feel like shit. Uh, when you really are a binge drinker, you keep going to meetings, but you can't stop drinking. It's just horrible. It's a horrible cycle to be in. That's why I call this step zero. It's that cycle where you can't even get to step one because you keep drinking. And even after working the 11 steps, I would argue they are amazing. Without the 11 steps, I still wouldn't be as spiritually healthy as I am today. But I kept drinking and I still don't know why because I re-went back with my sponsors and I went back and did them, did them, did them. And I, you could argue that I never sponsored anybody, but I believe I still would have drank. I had that crazy fucking mind. I, I just don't even want to get into it. Uh, AA is very black and white. And what do I mean by this? You count your days. You count how uh, uh, s many sober days you are. You have your birthdays. So it's like this thing where you add up these days and it's very black or white. Either you're sober or you're not sober and you start over. There's no progress. There's no progress. Let's say you're a drinker that binge drinks every night. You have like two bottles of wine. You have like a fucking half gallon of vodka whatever it is every night if you make progress to maybe just drinking on weekends and not being hung over every day i would say that's progress and then you move to maybe drinking like two times a month and you're hung over for two times a month and then you move to maybe one times a month that's fucking progress that's great to me from going from everyday drinker, your life is fucked up to drinking two times a month. That is huge progress. Now, that is not allowed in AA. You're shunned in AA. And you have to go back to zero days. And this makes you feel like shit. There's a lot of shame involved. There's a lot of lashback from the tribe. There's a lot of judgment. Even though they say they do not judge you. I've been there. I can tell you that's bullshit. They do judge you. It feels like shit. You feel like you're not worth shit. And you have to go back to zero days. You have to get a new chip. You have to become a newcomer. All this shit. And with naltrexone and with... Also, let me go back real quick. If you drink again, nine times out of ten, it will start out like, oh, man, I could drink again. I'm not an alcoholic. And then, you know, a week later, a month later, you're fucking drinking for days a week, uh... 
you're binging four days a week. You can't stop drinking. You're in a blackout, and you don't remember what the fuck happened three days ago. And it gets worse, right? You never get better when you're drinking. The problem always gets worse. This is my experience. My binging always got worse. I got madder. Your emotions get into it. You just want to drink even more because all the shame and the guilt because you're like, man, I can't get this. Everybody's saying that I don't want it. All this shit goes in your head and you want to just black out even more. With Naltrexone, I fucked up plenty of times. I didn't want to drink uh, the last time I drank, but my friend came over for the, the Conor McGregor fight and he was like, let's have some beers, man. And I was like, okay, it's part of the the Sinclair Method to drink, to take Naltrexone. Unfortunately, I was on Kratom and I didn't know you shouldn't mix the two. So I took Naltrexone and I drank the beer and all of a sudden I just felt very sick. I started sweating. Don't want to get into all the symptoms, but I felt like I was going to have to go to the hospital. I had one beer and didn't feel good. Did not feel good. It was a nightmare. But if that would have happened and I had told my sponsor and I told my uh, friends in AA, they would have been like, oh man, you know, it's, you don't want it bad enough. And not, I'm not saying that this is the, the go-to answer. I'm just saying this is my experience. A lot of sponsors told me I didn't want it bad enough. Um, they make you feel like shit. You have to go back and become a newcomer. Why would you feel good about that? It feels good after you accept it and after you get back on track a little bit. But like, does it feel good failing or feeling like you're failing? It doesn't. It does not feel like after 10 years, if you feel like you're at the same fucking spot that you got in when it was 10 years ago. It just doesn't feel good, at least to me. So... That's the difference between AA drinking and naltrexone drinking. There's literally like, oh shit, I fucked up, but I didn't binge. I just got sick and it never made me want to drink again. That was the last time I drank. That was in uh, July of last year. Uh, let me see. If you go back to drinking, there's so much shame. I just talked about that. You want to hide it. It's disappointing. There's a lot of judgmental, uh, sick people in AA. Positively, there is a lot of healthy people. Negatively, there's a lot of sick people in AA. I mean, that's just a fact. Um, you have to hear about God a lot. I'm not opposed to this. Uh, I do believe I have my own beliefs. AA actually helped me out in this because I was, uh, I was just skeptical, I would say. I wasn't closed off to it. It does make me sick when people try to force their beliefs on me. If I tell you, you know, I don't believe in that, I have a hard time, and you're trying to tell me, oh, well, you know, God loves you, God, this guy loves you, you got to do this, you got to do whatever, man. It's like, just let, let me have my views, you have your views, don't put them on me, I won't put my views on you, type of thing. You will hear, will hear about God a lot. Sometimes people talk about their religion, Some, a lot of people talk about Jesus, some people talk about Buddhism. And they're like, I don't give a shit if you're not, but like, it gets like that sometimes, not a lot, but you will, will hear mostly talk about God because that is part of the steps. Uh, a lot of people talk about their religions, even though you're not supposed to, I just said that 70% of sponsors do not take you through the steps, let alone the steps as outlined in AA. I think I touched on that earlier, but this is such a big part. The right way to go about it is being taken through the steps as outlined in the big book of AA. The blue book they give you or should give you that are available at most AA meetings for free. A sponsor is supposed to sit you down, go through it with you. How my sponsor did it with me that I thought was great. He would read a page, I would read a page or a paragraph, a paragraph. Go through it. Every time we got to a step, what did we do? We went through that step as outlined in the book. There's no better way to do it. That's it. There's no better way to do it. Um, yeah, so it's just sad to me that I got a sponsor or got sponsors that either just wanted to meditate or just wanted to take me on like these fucking come over and do this type of shit, wash my car, be of service, but clean my house, you know, like what the fuck is that? That's selfish. Um... Another thing about AA, 
you're always going to be an alcoholic. I believe I'm a real alcoholic. I'm a binger for life. What Naltrexon, is, Naltrexon, Naltrexon has done for me is it has, I'm just looking at the time. Um, thank you for watching this with me. Uh, I'm going to have to make it another video. So what Naltrexon has done for me is, I forgot what I was talking about. Oh, is but from the time I'm going to talk about from the time I started Naltrexon to when I got sober. I started Naltrexon around, it was right after I got married, so almost three years ago. It took me exactly about a year, nine months to a year to get extinct, right? I stopped drinking completely and then, yes, I did have some uh, like mess ups or relapses, but I don't consider them relapses. Uh, once you get to a certain point on Naltrexone, you don't get a buzz anymore. It takes away all the good feelings, um, dopamine hits, anything positive you get from drinking, that reward, takes it all away. Um, and I just didn't want to drink that much. I was getting down to like one beer at a time, and I was just like, oh, this doesn't taste good. And that, that would be it. That would be my mess up. That would be my uh, relapse. So that's that's what it did for me. From the starting time to completely fucking sober zero craving zero worry zero oh man am i gonna drink again am i if i'm gonna every time i see alcohol i'm like oh man i can't drink i can't drink i can't no hide it from me hide it from me no we can't have alcohol in the house uh out of sight out of mind none of that shit i can fucking have beer in the house and not want it choose mentally to not want it how many alcoholics can you say have gone from binge drinking to being able to choose to have beer in the house and just not want it and not think anything about it. There's no craving. There's no obsession. There's no positive anything tied to drinking. And how fucking crazy is that? That this is not talked about more. It just makes me so sad that this is literally a lifesaver. And people and therapists are still recommending AA as the number one thing. And not even knowing about uh, the Sinclair Method. From the time I started AA when I was 20 to the time I left AA, which I think is about 35, 36. I went to my last meeting. 16 years. Gave it my all. Over a consistent period of time. I would not have gone for 16 years if I didn't want to fucking get sober. I gave it my all. I tried different sponsors. I tried... Going through the steps, not going through the steps, being of service, going on panels, dry, uh, being dry, and it never worked. 100% just never worked. I, I worked the steps. I wanted to be sober. I got into groups. I went and did all the bullshit that they told me to go to. I went to a meeting every day. I went to two meetings every day. I did all the bullshit. I hang out with sober people. That obsession and the brain thing never fucking went away. That's just my experience. It never went away. The brain is a very, very, very powerful machine. And when it wants something, whether you think logically or emotionally or spiritually about it, it will control you if you do not know how to control it. And I never figured out how to control it. And there's alcoholics dying every day that want to control it, want to get sober, but their brain is too powerful and it's killing them. So think about it. 16 years in AA... Uh, which is 80%, 90% of people that actually go into AA, they want to get sober, or maybe they don't. I don't know, but I wanted to get sober. I didn't want to ruin my life. Um, 16 years, giving it my all, nothing. As opposed to a year on a, uh, the Sinclair Method, yes, you have to drink. But after like three, four months, it was like not even binging anymore. It was just, I would have like three beers and be like, all right, that was cool. You start being able to uh, not really give a shit about it anymore. Your brain doesn't have that control over you anymore, which is a fucking miracle to an alcoholic or a family uh, to a binge drinker. Uh, AA takes a long time to change. Um, six months sobriety... A year sobriety may seem like 
not a long time to a normal person, but for an alcoholic, it is incredible. Now, to a family of alcoholics that they're like, yeah, well, good job. We, you've ruined our fucking lives. So yeah, good job on a year, six months, whatever. And it's just like, it takes a long time in AA for you to start getting it, for you to start getting on your feet. It takes years, 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 years. Now, I'm still growing as a person, but I would say I've grown up exponentially like crazy in the past year. I I have I am not the same person I was two years ago. I am so much more mature thinking things like a, a mature adult, which I would say I was a child uh, two years ago, which is just insane to me that some of the stuff I was doing, how I thought about things. Uh, and the thing about naltrexone is it gives you the opportunity to go to AA to do the steps. You can do both. You just can't really talk about the Sinclair method, which kind of sucks. Um, when you go into AA, most alcoholics have heard, don't drink, just stop drinking. Don't drink, just don't drink. And what happens when you get in AA? You hear the same thing. Hey, just don't drink today. You know, just don't drink today. If you feel like drinking, just don't drink. It's like, okay, what the fuck am I doing here? Why? Uh, I've heard this from my entire family. If I could have done that, wouldn't I have done that by now? And there is a little bit of white knuckling in AA until you get through the steps. But it's just like, it's annoying to me how they still say that. And I don't know. It just gets under my skin because that's not very effective. If you could just not drink, then it should be that easy. Just don't drink. But it's don't drink and find a sponsor. Don't drink. Work the big book. Don't drink. Uh, be around sober people. Don't drink. Call your sponsor before you drink. Not after. Uh, now, this is my opinion, but the AA B uh, big book could be outdated. And this is what I mean. It says science may one day accomplish this um, in one of the parts and I believe that we're there with uh, the Sinclair method. I think that science has accomplished a way to be sober. Um, obviously, I am living proof of that and people just don't wanna believe it. It's not, there's no real hard work that is put into it. There is discipline and I'm a very disciplined person. You have to stick to the plan, which I wanted to be sober, so I stuck to the fucking plan. If I drink again, I'm gonna take naltrexone. I'm going to stick to the plan. I'm going to comply with the program because I don't ever want to go back and become that person again when I was drinking. I don't want my wife to go through that. I don't want my son to go through that. I am very serious about my sobriety. Uh, a lot of people can speak in the meetings. It can become a complaining thing. Um, although this is not the case, uh, most of the time, most of the time it's from experience and uh, sharing, you know, work the 12 steps of AA, uh, you know, um, I'm having issues, but I got over it, this type of thing. I called my sponsor, what to do, it shows you what to do. But a lot of people can give you advice that is not from the big book, which is, this is something to work out for. I was taught only listen to advice that comes straight out of the book of AA and this is the main core foundation that I would stick to if you do choose to go to AA. Only listen to people that speak from the big book of AA. Now there could be like some healthy shit like go to the gym. That's always good. That's I think everybody knows that they should be exercising and eating healthy and drinking water and staying away from uh, processed shit. I mean that's just kind of like that's a different subject. But um, could be more of a social club than focusing on the 12 steps now. There are a lot of alcoholics in AA, but there are a lot of non-alcoholics in AA that just like the social aspect of it. Now, that's great. It could fulfill that void if you're an alcoholic that has no friends. If you're a drinker like me, I just stayed inside. I pretty much ruined all my relationships with my family, a lot of my friends, and I was ruining my relationship with my wife. And I was about to be pretty much homeless before I found uh 
the Sinclair method. So if you find AA and you enjoy that type of setting, for me, I just don't like to be around a lot of people. I'm very introverted. Um, people piss me off. I'm very em empathic. I feel other people's energy. And I just, it's emotionally draining to me to be around a bunch of people. So, but a lot of people go there that aren't alcoholics. They just like the social sh situation. And yeah, that's not good. Uh, if you do drink, you often hear you don't want it bad enough. I've said that before. There used to be this guy in the treatment center. He was like, if you don't want it bad enough, go the fuck back out. Go the fuck back out. Stay the fuck out. Because you don't want it back bad enough. If you're not done drinking, go the fuck back out. And I get what he was saying. But, like, for a person like me that really genuinely wanted to stop and could not stop, my brain would just override me. That craving would be too intense that I would get a couple weeks, a month, and I would go back to drinking and it would always end up worse. And I always thought, man, I feel so guilty because I don't want it bad enough. I don't want it bad enough. I guess I'm not to the point where I want it bad enough. And then I would get that fire lit back under me. I'm like, I want it. I want it. I'm going to go back. And this cycle continued for 16 years. Sponsors can be harsh, uh, dominating, and patronizing. This is not saying about every sponsor. Like I said, I had a great sponsor who took me through the big book of AA. But I also had sponsors. This one guy was bipolar. And I did not know he was bipolar. Unfortunately, I stayed with him for a few months. I think like five or six months. And I didn't find out till like two months in that he was bipolar. But, you know, you hear these certain things in AA that you have to follow your sponsor's orders. You have to follow your sponsor's orders. Get a sponsor and do everything they say. And, you know, when you're weak and you don't know what else to do, you're trusting in this process of AA and you're trying to do your best you can. And I was just trying to follow orders. And I did not know this guy was bipolar, but obviously I figured it out because he'd go through these cycles. But he would be on these bad cycles where he was in a bad mood and just be a fucking dick to me and say these very, very mean things and um, put me down and be very patronizing and belittle me and saying that I didn't want it bad enough and that I'm an idiot or not an idiot, but like he said I'm the most selfish person he ever met in his life and that I don't know shit and that I shouldn't be saying the things that I'm saying because I was like asking questions or something and just made me feel like complete garbage. And I remember him making me break down like multiple times, just like feeling like I wasn't doing anything right. And it was just horrible. It was very, very, very hard, especially if you were in nar narcissistic relationships like me. Uh, I was always a very, very uh, weak person. I never knew how to set boundaries for myself. And I was in a very horrible narcissistic relationship where my girlfriend would uh, be a drinker and she'd just like say the worst things to me. The worst fucking things would bring me down and say it was my fault. And it would pretty much gaslit me. So if you come from families like that, from relationships like that, and then you have a sponsor that tries to dominate you and, and belittle you like that, it is very fucking hard to want to be in the program of AA. And there, like I said, there's very sick people in AA. You know, I don't blame him, but I just really wish that that could be avoided for people that are weaker, that don't know what to do. I just want to tell you to look for a sponsor that will take you through the big book of AA. Look for people that have what you want. Be very, very careful and guarded about choosing the people you are around in AA because there's very, very sick people and there's very, very uh, strong people and healthy people that have been through the, the steps that uh, if they have what you want, I would say choose them. Listen to them. Uh, see how their family life is because if they argue with their family and it, there's a bunch of tension between them and their friends and their family and they don't have a good family life, just stay the fuck away from them because you don't want that. So don't be quick to choose a sponsor. Be... Be slow to make a decision and just stick with it once you find a good one. Thank you so much for sticking with me. This is so long and I didn't mean it for you. I didn't mean for it to be this long. I'm going to finish this up. Uh, I'm on the Sinclair Method. Thank you so much for making it this far if you're watching. Um, 
78% success rate. Completely removes cravings, obsessions, dopamine hit that has anything to do with anything positive that alcohol do, uh, does to your brain. And I mean everything. And this is my experience too. I'm not lying. I'm not just making this fucking up. It took away the obsession, the craving that I had since I was 14 years old. And I would say even before that, because I was craving for something to take all this pain away, all this, um, this anxiety, this tension, and I was just craving something. If I could do anything to take this pain away, and once I found alcohol, alcohol, unfortunately, it took it away. Uh, it just removes it. I don't know how else to explain it. It just does that if you follow the, uh, the program of the Sinclair Method. It is very simple. It is very easy. But it only works how well you do it. Just like, well, they say in AA, but obviously that didn't work for me. It doesn't work for 90% of the people that go there. Just saying. Um, for 78% of the people that do the Sinclair Method, it works how well you comply with the program. I don't think I need to speak more on that. You drink only after you've taken naltrexone uh, an hour before. And you wait an hour after you take the naltrexone and then you start drinking. You don't worry about how much you drink. That's pretty much the basis and the core of the program. Allows you the option to go to AA and work the steps. Now, this is a positive thing. You can actually do both. I wish I never had all those bad experiences in AA because I would be more willing to go to AA and do the steps and get all that spiritual growth because they offer so much good spiritual growth there. The steps are amazing. It's just unfortunate that uh, it's very hard to know to get a sponsor, to get a big book, to go and just get a fucking sponsor that will take you through the big book properly, quickly. Uh, because most newcomers, if they have a day or four days or a week, it is like insane. Your mind is just ridiculous you don't know what's going on it's almost like you can't it's like someone put a blinder over your eyes and you can't even see out of your eyes because you're living in your head and you don't know if you can make it the next hour so uh if you can go to aa i would absolutely highly recommend it if you could do both if you could stop drinking and then go to aa and get that spiritual growth do the steps the uh, the amend the um, amendments the amends the four step and the amends are the biggest steps that really provided me the spiritual relief that I needed. All this stuff that I had on my chest and that I didn't know was in me affecting me um, when I was sober, I got that out. It really changed my life. It really honestly I cannot give AA twelve steps credit enough for doing that. I never would have been able to grow that much spiritually without the 12 steps uh found tsm a few years ago i got sober a com completely sober a year after starting like i said before it only took me a year after starting to get completely sober this is a miracle um like i said aa took me 16 years and uh never worked the negative about the sinclair method uh, excuse me you have to drink. Now, this is a part where family and friends and even you, the drinker, may be very, very hesitant about. It may seem like snake oil. It may seem like, oh, this is just an easy way to keep drinking, man. What the fuck? Like, you think I'm going to allow you to drink? And it seems like bullshit. But if you think about it, it's retraining your brain to block the dopamine. Then you drink. You get no dopamine hit. So it retrains your brain. Alcohol is not a positive thing because you're not getting the positive dopamine hit that is so strong when you drink. Um, but that could be a very negative thing to family members, friends, loved ones, things like that. It can take a year or more uh, to extinction. Another negative thing or perceived negative. This is a big positive for me. But you have to drink. For that year however long it takes you to extinction some people are natural responders and it takes them you know a couple days a month whatever and they get sober really quick 
for me, it took me a year. I was such a binge drinker that I loved alcohol so much. I couldn't get away from it. It was just part of my soul. It was like something that I can't explain. It was with me for so long since I was 14 that I've lived more than half my life with alcohol. So it was just very, very hard to get rid of. Um, also a huge one. If you're on antidepressants, I started when I was not on antidepressants. So it worked for me. After a year when I was sober, I started getting very depressed. Um, I got on antidepressants. And like I said, I drank again. I had a few like mess ups. There was one of these mess ups was a two month period. I got on antidepressants. Before this, when I was off, I would drink three, four beers. Like I said, there was a two month period where I got on antidepressants. The only thing that has changed antidepressants. I got on Effexor specifically and still on uh, the, the, the Sinclair method taking Naltrexon. I drank and I could not stop drinking and I was drinking in a different way than I drank. I would binge, but it would be from morning till night. I drink an 18 pack and it was weird because I wouldn't get drunk. I would just get buzzed, but I'd be able to control that buzz. But all alcoholics say that I wish I was not an alcoholic so I could drink all day. So in that way, I wanted to be buzzed all day. I love that feeling. I love that feeling of being buzzed. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, now Trexon and Effexor allowed me to drink and I, I had a really hard time getting off. So those two months were crazy, but it was, uh, it was be very careful if you're on antidepressants and trying to do the Sinclair method. It's not widely known. It's not very, uh, talked about most therapists today still do not talk about the Sinclair method. They recommend AA. This is very unfortunate because it works so well and it's so not known about that there's kind of a social stigma, a social unbelief. There's a, a belief socially that AA is widely known. Probably everybody knows a friend or family member in AA, even though it has a horrible success rate. They still say go to AA just because it's more popular, even though it fucking sucks, even though the chances are not in your favor. Until the Sinclair method gets the traction that it needs and it's widely known that it has a almost 80% success rate It's just gonna take time, but I'm sure that this is gonna grow the more people that help the more people that see the the facts see the people getting their lives saved and It's just crazy to me how I've even gotten comments on this channel that it's snake oil that I don't know what I'm talking about and I'm just speaking from experience. It worked for me, and I, I'm just sad for the people who don't believe it. If you've been through what I've been through, and my wife, what I put her through, and you see what I'm going through now, how much I'm growing, how great our relationship is, if you could take your alcoholic or you could take yourself as an alcoholic and change your life 100%, you would not be thinking this is snake oil. You would be like, this is a fucking miracle. Thank you so much for Naltrexon, and it's just crazy to me. Uh, the most, I, I don't know if, it, I forgot what I wrote down, but, oh, this is about AA. The most uh, time I had in AA was nine months, and... You can be sober even in when AA and just be miserable. It's called dry drunk. It's basically when uh, you're not drinking and you're just fucking miserable and you're a fucking asshole and you're basically drunk without being drunk, I guess. It's like you're so irritable because you want to drink so bad. You're not at ease. You're, in, you're a tense person. You want to drink, you're you're holding yourself back, you don't know what to do with yourself, your mind's going crazy, you're the opposite of at peace, and you're just kind of a miserable fuck to be around, and this is me, I'm telling my experience, the longest time I had was nine months, my mom had just passed away, uh, like I said, I had that Buddhist sponsor, I had, my dad took my truck away, he, he and I didn't have a good relationship at this time, so he's trying to punish me once he... My mom died because she had so much control. He was a pushover. So once he had control, he took my truck away. 
and I didn't have any friends, any family. Uh, my dad was against me. I was living at his house, my, my mom's house, but she died. I was playing video games 12 hours a day, drinking energy drinks, and I was fucking miserable. It was one of the worst times of my life, but I was sober. I was sober. I was sober for nine months, and I just couldn't take it anymore. The first time I got out, got my truck back, uh, I went over to my one of my friend's house, and she had alcohol, and it was just really bad. But I hope you enjoyed this. Sorry for taking so long. This is such a long video. I uh, love you. Um, I hope, I pray that your loved one, you get help, you get sober, and you get as happy as I am because the Sinclair Method gave me my fucking life back. And if you understand how important that is, you will take this video seriously. I love you. Bye.